about the Church of St. Stephen? Well, the first church will last laugh, rules fast growing stack, which is 150 percent less dogma, it's a light religion, one holy day a year. I'm Bishop Joy, I'm Seminole Circuit, head of the first church of last laugh. Uh, it's a snack religion, you know, we have one, uh, it's April 1st, it's one day at uh, noon, we meet, we pray, we have a lot of fun. And you're already a member of the first church of last laugh, you just don't know it, you forgot, you forgot you're a member. So fate's brought you here to this portal. Uh, behind that lady, the portals behind that lady, uh, to be remembered into the one pretty true church through a series of six almost painless, almost painless rituals uh, in honor of the, the great Larry. So come on in and get remembered into the first church of last laugh. St. Stupid said, I know, I know, but you know, you never know. He said, so far, so what? He said, the truth is funny. He said, the nearer you are, the closer you get. More importantly, he said, remember, don't for he said, don't forget, remember, or remember, don't you know, I, I don't remember. I forget. We'll get back to you on that.
got him drunk, took him in a back alley, ripped open his chest, and pulled out it. And there it is. There's a picture of it right there. A banker's heart. They actually have hearts. They're just kind of black and smelly and stinky. Now, usually in the parade, we throw pennies at the banks. We bless the banks with pennies in our parade when it's through the financial district. And we throw, here's a Wells Fargo. Here's a penny you didn't get from me this year. That feels good. And behind our silly little parade, throwing pennies through the financial district, is another parade of homeless people. Thank you. Uh, so we'll just give a nice a finger and a fuck you to the uh, banker's heart on three. Ready? One, two, three. Uh, here's the socks over here. No, no, no. The confession right over here. Okay, come here. All right. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? I'll come back to you. What's the, what's the stupidest thing you've ever done? I know. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? I looked through my glasses when they were on my head. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? <laughs> that'll, that'll happen. That'll happen. Sit, sit. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? Hated someone. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? Hated someone. She has no thing. I'll be back to you. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? <laughs> stupidest thing you've ever done? skateboard by holding on to the back of my friend's leg with the skateboard and it didn't work very well. <laughs> Ow. Stupidest thing you've ever done? I drove off a bridge in Los. The First Church and the Last Laugh provides you, the spiritual consumer, a two-dimensional spiritual scapegoat. Next time you go out and do something stupid, there will be a next time you do something stupid, won't there? We all will do something stupid in the future. It's unavoidable, it's in our DNA. But now you don't have to beat yourself up about it. You don't have to hit yourself on the head and say, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm wrong, blah, blah. No. You just say, I had a, I had a visitation by St. Stupid. I was momentarily possessed by St. Stupid. <laughs> this is X-rated, so close your ears. It's not my fucking fault. Repeat that. It's not my fucking fault. Louder! It's not my fucking fault! You didn't hear a thing there, right? It's...
Get out of here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here with Ed Holmes. Thank you for those wonderful clips, Mr. Holmes. That is a joy. I want to bid a special thanks out to Stephen Parr for having such a great venue here at Alpha. <laughs> and a real special thanks to my friend Eric Dugdale for being the greatest historian on film on, uh, in California and for driving me up here. Boy, thanks, Eric. <laughs> We're going to try to be... Yeah, okay. <laughs> So, Ed, it is a real pleasure to be here with you, and I thank you so much. Thank you. The first question is, what's the best thing for a human being? The best thing for a human being is to be in touch with their insignificance. Very good. Thank you. And so, what is your favorite form of information? Uh, a parade. It's good. Why do you think humans collect information? Uh, Keep them well. They gotta keep themselves busy between uh, the, the two eternities. You know, a little spark in between two eternities. They got nothing else to do, and they gotta figure out what the fuck's going on. So they just keep taking things. What? what is, will this explain it? Will this explain it? Will this explain it? Uh, there's nothing else to do. That's great because we say the gap is where the action is. We're not talking about the clothing store. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, do you think this tendency for humans to collect information or gather it is DNA? Is it hardwired, or did we learn it? Uh, it's, it's it's evolutionary survival thing. It's like whatever made the brain go, you know, like uh, Terence McKenna said, it was the mushrooms. Monkey wait, the monkey ate the mushroom, <coughs> and the, the mushrooms is what made the brain expand, and uh, the brain expanded, and then everything else just took off from there. Uh, it's a uh, uh, it's just the the luck of evolution, I guess. That's all it is. It's just that's the way it worked out. If you don't take in information, you're not paying attention. If you're not paying attention, you're dead. Very good. Frank Zappa said, "Who's pluking the monkey?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you like that one. Okay, so can you uh, conjure up your earliest memory ever? Uh, yeah, I was in a fever dream. Uh, I had these. Uh, I grew up in uh, East Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I remember I had this problem with getting fevers, and I had dreams, and I get these hallucinations, where everything would shift, the perspective, like this whole room, if I had the fever dream, would suddenly go, would shift, and everybody in the back would go, like this. But at the same time, they're like looming on me. So it was like this scary, scary visualization of the room going, with everything going, and it would just freak me out. I remember running down the stairs naked and my parents picking me up and trying to figure out what to do with me being in a fever uh, and I had that for years but that was the first my first memory was that that hallucination but I, I kicked it it was like years later maybe five years later that I was in bed and I was having it and the room was going like that and I remember pounding on the wall to make the wall stay right there pounding on the wall and it stopped and it never came back no meds huh no meds yeah! All right. Let's hear it for no meds. So, is memory a curse or a blessing? Uh, yes. <laughs> Could you um, tell us your uh, earliest role models within your immediate family, just briefly, and what you specifically get from them? Uh, yeah, Dad, of course. Dad, of course. Uh, Dad had a weird sh uh, working shift. He worked swing shift at the CEI, Cleveland Electric Illuminating Power Plant. He was a valve twister, steam mechanic. And he, so he had these strange shifts. He'd work one shift and then a couple days off another shift. So I'd see him only occasionally. I didn't have a regular seeing of him. So my dad was slightly out of the, and so I missed him. So when he was around, I was just right there with him. And uh, it was his sense of humor, sitting on the couch, watching television in the 50s, watching the golden age of television comedy. Mm -hmm. Sid Caesar, Red Skelton, mm -hmm. Jack mm -hmm. Benny, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all these shows. And my dad laughing his ass off at that stuff. And me sitting there going, oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to watch this. And that was probably what steered me into showbiz, just sitting on the couch with my dad, uh, enjoying him and enjoying uh, comedy. Beautiful. And say, outside your immediate family, any early role models? Oh, yeah. Uh, most probably movies, you know, uh, adventure movies. You know, John Wayne. You know, I wanted to be a I wanted to be a hard hat diver because uh, John was it John Lee? No, it was Ricardo Montalban. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, God, I remember forgetting his name. 
uh, sponge divers, yeah. hard hat, you know, the hard helmet thing. And I, man, that looks like adventure. I want to be an underwater guy. Mm -hmm. I, I want, that's all I want to do. Uh, and then sailors thing, you know, John Wayne being a sailor, John Wayne submarine movies, uh, all those heroic movies of the 50s, uh, yeah. those were all big inspirations. Beautiful. And um, did your parents raise your particular religion? Uh, luckily, no. I had, a big, had like about four or five years of Catholicism. My mother thought she was a Catholic. Luckily, we moved enough so that, that we got away from the Catholic Church, and she said, well, I'll send you to this local Protestant church. So I had a little dose of Protestantism. And then in high school, I went and hung out with the kids that went to the Episcopalian Church, so I had a dose of that. And so I had mild forms of uh, a dead man on a stick thing. And, uh, dead man on a stick? I was able is to... Is that original line? No, no. It's, who, who came up, who with, came up with it? Me. That is a good Doug line. Doug Wellman right there. Dead man on a stick. Uh, so, I had, uh, so, but, so I had a lot of holes in my religious upbringing. Yeah. And uh, I filled them in with uh, reading a lot. And uh, the reading expands, you know, past those boundaries. And then I, you know, bumped into, I remember when I was in the Navy, I was reading H.G. Wells' History of the World. And the, uh, uh, his chapter on Buddhism still is the most amazing description of what Buddhism is, actually is, is H.G. Wells' History of the World, Volume 1 and 2. But check it out. And I remember going, that like twisted my mind. I went, wow, that's very interesting. Thing, a way of looking at life, you know, and, yeah. uh, and the spiritual side. So it, it kind of steered me away from the uh, that Christian shit, and um, I've been weird ever since. <laughs> Do you think evil people exist, or does evil use people as a vehicle? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't discount the possibilities of something in another realm uh, that we can't see or hear, another vibration. Uh, I don't discount that possibility, but I just think it's... Uh, People, brains are, you know, their chemistry. Yeah. I think it's just brain chemistry. So yeah. everybody's get a di different mix. Everybody gets a different deck, uh, a hand dealt from the deck in their chemistry. And some people got a little bit of this and too much of that, and that's where evil comes from. Yeah. I probably think. it's a mechanical thing. I think yeah. more than anything else. Now this question is: How do you advise people to deal with their enemies and uh, or deal with enemies? And I'm going to just set it up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. It's morphed into the word frenemies. Um, JFK says, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. Uh, J uh, let's see, Fellini says, I need an enemy. And lastly, Chinese proverb goes, uh, he who cannot agree with his enemy is controlled by them. Now, just basically got the question, how you advise one to deal with enemies, but just to start, how would you respond to the first one, Alan Watts, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I've listened to a lot of Alan. Uh, he's very influential also in my uh, spiritual expansion. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but I think it's every enemy is different. And that, yeah, for some enemies, that's the Alan Watts thing. For some enemies, it's... Uh, you know, it's others, uh, the, the other approaches. Uh, some of them you Aikido, and uh, some of them you, <laughs> you punch in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. In the uh, American Indians say your enemy is your best teacher. Yeah, you'll learn a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you learn how to punch somebody in the nose. Yeah. So uh, James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin just over a hundred years ago, and he said, I'm out of here. This is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? In other words, why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? Uh, it gives you, it's like, a, it's like a, another window. It's a, you can't be everywhere. Uh, you can only be here and now, but if you go to a play, you see a movie, you read a work of fiction, uh, you're getting a, another angle on reality. Okay, another, it, you know, may not be possible, but it's another angle on reality, and you can learn something from it. So it's a way of just expanding your uh, range of vision. Yeah. And Lewis Hines published photographs of child labor in newspapers, printed matter, and Cultural historians and people in general basically said that was the tipping point to change laws. Upton Sinclair, same thing, printed book, jungle, change laws. So the question sort of twofold, basically has any 
film, music, art, or theater actually been the tipping point to change laws. I'm all for we shall overcome and really help the civil rights movement, but generally the people don't say that was the tipping point to change laws. And the, the basic question is, is it still possible to have this same kind of impact where people go, that's the tipping point with these other mediums? Uh, I say historically, what's that Sinclair Lewis about the meat yards? The, uh, the jungle. The jungle. Yeah. Supposedly, that was a big, that was a big Right, but point. that's printed matter. So we know that printed matter has done that, maybe because yeah. it's the old, one of the oldest mediums. But I'm asking if these other mediums, uh, has there been tipping points, and can they actually have that same kind of impact? No, yeah. Uh, tipping points, I don't know. I don't know. I can't point to a tipping point. Yeah. You, you, I've listened, you know, listened to the folk music in the 60s, and you know, rock and roll was supposed to be, you know, it's a protest form. Uh, and have any of those really been a tipping point? I think, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anybody think it, any tipping points in yeah. music? I think it's just keeping an ember alive. Yeah. I think yeah. it's just you know, blowing on the, the ember of uh, you know, you know, revolution and uh, another possibility. Yeah. And that hopefully that goes off and lands somewhere fertile and that sets something on fire and yeah. burns down Bank of America. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> that was good. Yeah, and I'm all for it. I'm not trying to discount this all. And one friend said uh, maybe uh, Ralph Nader's press conferences as performance art changed uh -huh. Uh -huh. the law for CFO. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, a screenwriting teacher once told me that a great film, great piece of art, is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. And asking filmmakers about this and people like yourself, one said, well, Kubrick says the opposite. A great film is when you can, a great piece of art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? Absolutely not at all. Um, I have no intention whatsoever. I'm just, uh, I, well, no, I have full, I'm full of intentions. Uh, too much education gave me this thread of the Feast of Fools. Yeah. This and and what the fool means in society, so m I definitely intended to update that old feast of fool European tradition. Yeah, I mean everybody's got one. Uh, you're late. I got to start all over again. <laughs> I, I'm at home and I. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, my intention was. I mean, I believed in what the feast of fool said. It said. You know, things get turned upside down. You got to have that uh, spontaneity. You got to get out from underneath the heel, you know, of the the crown or the cross, which was the European thing, which Feast of Fools was, uh, getting out under the heel, and then just expressing this joy of life. So uh, that's how the parade came about. Was just connecting yeah. with that. The intention was uh, go express joy of life amidst the great canyons of uh, the real temples. Yeah, of our yeah that was great. And. Um Maria Cal says, in order to be a performer, which I asked you if you're at a cocktail party and somebody says, what do you do? You say, I'm a performer. In order to be a performer, you have to have half your brain in complete control and the other half out of control. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my favorite lines ever is, I'm trying to get more control over my spontaneity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, it's like I, I grew up and it was all, yeah, control, trying to find a way to focus your mind. Uh, learn a thing, learn a trade, I get in the Navy, I wind up in a nuclear power field, uh, I go to school for two years in nuclear, I was going to be Homer Simpson. I was headed for Homer Simpson in the 60s. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Don't! Uh, and that was such control, I mean, I kicked my, I mean, I wasn't a great student in high school, but here I am doing this nuclear engineering study for a, a year before I go, go on, a, on a boat, and it was really trying to wrangle my brain. I was, and and I, I had trouble, but I did it. But I had trouble. And I said, maybe I'm not cut out for this. This engineering thing is really, you know, e, 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 it's precision. And I, it, uh, and so I did it, but I wasn't that good and I wasn't that happy. And I finally got a drug saved my life. Oh, marijuana, I got busted for smoking marijuana. I got kicked out of the nuclear power field and uh, sent on a different road. And that getting out from underneath that responsibility, because that was the, the deepest, the heaviest responsibility in my life, was being in the nuclear. We had Admiral Rickover. Admiral Rickover was riding a shotgun on this whole program, and then I, I got to give props to the Navy. They've had pretty good record with this horrible, dangerous fucking thing, Fukushima fucking thing. Uh, 
the, but the Navy has done pretty good, so-so, but -so. no big catastrophes. Uh, and it was due to this control. Yeah. Oh, oh, control, oh, the control. Oh, you, you move forward. Why are you moving forward? <laughs> Where are you going? What's that for? What's that going to do to that? What, you know, every move you made was you looked back, forward, sideways in three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions. Well, when I got out from under that, something happened, and my, my, the uncontrolled part of the brain came to the fore. And when I stepped on a stage, but you know, I took a, you know, a, a course in, in theater uh, at Laney Junior College on the GI Bill, the whole thing went, opened up. And for me, it was, it was you know, uh, freedom. Yeah. And that was well put, and I appreciate it. How, where do you think that came from? Your own thinking and logic, or the way your parents raised you, or what's Com the roots of that? that? Combination. I mean, yeah, it's like. You have a comprehensive awareness thing kind of going. There is, you know, who knows how much is the hardwire, who much is the, how much is the you know, implanted software, who, how much is, you know, my uncle standing there telling me sea stories, how much is that movie I went and saw down at the corner matinee. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I fell in love with deserts. Did I fall in love with deserts in the West because I watched all these cowboy movies in Cleveland, Ohio, and saw these cowboy movies and saw these fucking landscapes? And it was adventure amidst that landscape. So is that why I love the desert? Uh, is that why I wound up in the Navy and uh, going aboard submarines? Because I watched all those hero movies. Uh, was that the, you know what programmed me? Was it my destiny? Was it that? I, I have no idea. I think it's a combination of all of the above. Yeah. Well, you won because the, my series is all about inventing new questions. So you answered my question with a question. That was very good. Thank you. <laughs> now, Ruth Draper, there's a baby blue Riviera pack out in back. You can get the keys from Stephen. Mm -hmm. You won. So uh, Ruth Draper said, and this is a, a little interesting quote. I'd love you to talk about it in a second. The key is to bring the audience up onto the stage and into the scene with you. It is they who must give you even more than you give them in the way of imagination and creative power. Pretty well summarized, but how do you do that? Uh, you do a style of theater that, uh, uh, that doesn't have a fourth wall, that doesn't have that uh, normal convention of the play in a theater as uh, a holy place. A lot of people go to theater, they go and they sit down, they shut up, and it, it's happening before them and they don't engage. As opposed to people here, everybody's seen the mime troupe. The mime troupe, it's outdoors, there's no fourth wall, there's dogs barking, there's drunks stumbling on stage, there's sirens, there's all kinds of things happening, there's mistakes on stage, and you acknowledge it and you play with the audience with it. And uh, that style of theater, that outdoor style, that the mime troupe does that I've been doing for 25 years. Um, and then uh, the parades in, in the streets, there is, yes, it's taking the performance and putting it in the middle of reality rather than uh, on a stage, on a, you know, on a thing here, and then separation from the audience. It's getting out there and mixing right. with the audience. Very good. And um, McClune said that everything we invent extends some human part of us. So. Skin is extended by our clothing, and the knife and fork extends our teeth. What would the parade, as a human invention, extend for you? My, my feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredible feat, uh, the parade. <laughs> and uh, as a, a student of theater and a practicer of theater, and you actually teach theater, don't you? Yeah, I teach okay. uh, yeah, physical theater. Uh, what would you say physical theater extends? Uh, your, uh, uh, your core, the inner core of your body, uh, and, uh, it's attendant limbs, everything, it's like this right here, the spine, it extends the spine, spine's got all the, uh, the wiring in there, okay, it's connected to everything, okay, so it's extending the spine through all the wiring, through all the appendages, and, uh, it extends those in the world. Well, you give a clue, and that was good. Did you ever read it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, that was really good. Uh, I, I interviewed Harry North recently. He was in uh, Marty Scorsese's first six films, and he's actually a great poet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that uh, method acting is turning the private into public. Is that what you're talking about when you say the core? You're turning... What are you talking about, that, the core? Because I, 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 yeah. uh, that was a great word to use, core. I would say... Uh, 
not being a method actor myself, and, uh, knowing about it, but not having done it, uh, not being even drawn to that style of acting. Uh, to me, it would it, 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 it's not about my experience, bringing my emotions and experience to the part. It's just it's bringing what's happening, not my experience, but what I am now, what I'm feeling right now, what the what's called for on the stage right now or in the street, what's called for with this audience, you know, it it varies. So uh, for me, yeah, uh, it's a core thing, but it's not that core of uh, a method actor. Who yeah. is going back into his history and recalling and bringing that forward and then projecting it. I'm skipping that part. I'm just be happy there. Right. So sort of be here now. Yeah. Or get there later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's been said that film as an art form has been swindled by capitalism. When I first heard that, I thought, everything's been swindled by capitalism. <laughs> and uh, cohort, I'm doing a show at uh, Craig Baldwin's place tomorrow night. Hope you all come. Uh, Craig said, when I said that to him, he says, yeah, and it's our job to swindle it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how would you take it? Like, let's just say theater as an art form has been swindled by capitalism. Any comment? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's why that's why the mind trip exists. It's taken the theater form and brought it into the parks and given it away for free to people who can't see theater, people who can't afford that ACT Berkeley rep ticket. Uh, they can come and see the mind troop show, and so that's subverting uh, what's happened in theater, uh, yeah. capitalism. Uh, free shows in the parks, pass yeah. the hat. Yeah, of course, it remains to be seen whether. That survival is going to uh, that method is going to help the mind troops survive. Donate to the mind troop. Very good, thank you. I get that letter every year, yeah. and that sure <laughs> is fancy how they give you the nice letter and say please contribute. Now this uh, this is a couple questions about effectiveness and intention again, how, how we can accomplish things. Jean Luc Godard saw Michael Moore at uh, the Cannes Film Festival when he premiered his Fahrenheit film, mm -hmm. and he says this film is going to help Bush get elected. Well, it didn't necessarily help Bush get elected, but it could have galvanized pro-Bushers. And um, bottom line is we've had uh, 20 years of pretty good political, hard-hitting political documentaries. The question is, do they activate or pacify? Yeah, good question. That's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, like, I'm a big fan of Colbert and Stewart and Bill Maher and, uh, and Michael Moore, and uh, I like what they do. But I do wonder if people are just, you know, going. They're watching it and they feel, oh, I've done my part. I've, I've watched Michael, the new Michael Moore film. I've paid my, yeah. or I, uh, I've laughed at the, you know, the antics of Stuart and Colbert. Okay, that's enough. I'm wondering if that does happen. If that does short cut. Uh, but again, I'm thinking it. No, it keeps the ember alive. I think yeah. the satire that happens with, in, in that crowd uh, keeps the keeps the questions in the forefront. Yeah. It, with humor is the greatest weapon, and people laughing uh, and talking and, and relaying those jokes and passing on those links uh, on the web, and those, they get cycled a lot. People are being constantly exposed to that satire, and I think that does have a positive yeah. thing, it, but there's still it has to overcome uh, the ingrained human apathy, you know, ingrained American apathy. <laughs> ah, fuck it, humans. Yeah. yeah everybody. Very good. Ed, can satire be destructive? I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that was the right answer. Thank you. Um, so Duchamp said, there's no art without an audience. What role does the audience play in your creative process before the make, you know, during the making of, not during? During the making of? Yeah, yeah, the making of. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, in the, in the mind troop style, when we're writing a mind troop show, you know, we take a subject and then we say, what's the angle we don't do on this subject? And then when in the creation of the show, creation of the scenes, the characters, uh, development of the story, it's always that, well, you know, that does, does our audience already know that? We've got to give them something different. And we, uh, we do a lot of assumptions. We say, oh, no, no this you know, Bay Area audience, now they know that. We need to give them another level, another angle. Uh, so... Uh, but then we go to places like Modesto and Stockton and uh, small towns in the valley. We, uh, you know, kind of go, well, we can throw this joke out and put this joke in here because it fits better for these guys. 
So our yeah, we're we're playing uh, we're playing God a little bit, you know. We're going. Well, I think I know what they think, you know. But that's you know that's how we do it. It, it seems to work most of the time. Right. Yeah. So you're saying you sort of custom the show. Sometimes when you change a city, you might yeah. custom it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so Cindy Sheehan said, uh, "We're just we're preaching to the choir, and there isn't even a choir." So how do you avoid doing that, or is that still good? Is yeah, it's still good, yeah. yeah. We get accused all the time, uh, mind yeah. truth, preach the choir. we got to have a choir, the choir yeah. and the choir's got to know how big it is. Yeah. The choir's got to get together in Dolores Park and see that it's 3,000 people strong on 4th of July. 4th of fucking July, the Holy Patriot Day, and they're here to, to hear, to watch the mind truth version, you know, of the day's events, the year's events, you know, uh, the zeitgeist. And they're here to participate in this um, yeah, and they want to see, they want to feel. Uh, then when they're laughing at you know, Dick Cheney being a jerk, an asshole, you know, they're feeling this power of a crowd. And they, they get engaged. They go, yeah, they, and they keep, yeah. all right, they keep, it keeps that flame alive. And then there's always a few people on the edge, you know, that show up. Oh, it's a funny show. Oh, it's cute. Oh, it's and then, boom, get your heads blown off. Uh, figured it. Uh, so, yeah, you got to preach to the choir. The choir's got to know what it is, and then the choir's got to give money so you can go out and reach, not the choir. Yeah. Very good. And you said that word feeling, I'm uh, bringing up now. I, Obama got elected because he hired George Lakoff to teach him that, uh, hey, you know what the Republicans did for their huge reign? Was they went after feeling and not issues. So fuck the, the issues, go for the feeling. Oh, and then he fired Lakoff. But can you talk about that? Strategies, political strategies. Uh, yeah, feelings over issues. Uh, it's it's not what's needed, uh, but it's what you know can get you elected, so you can deal with what's needed. Uh, you know, I'm definitely a uh, caught myself in the camp of disappointees in the in the Obama camp, uh, but I'm always holding out the hope that you know he's going to pull it off this next election. And then his next four years, his last four years, he's going to be whamming and bamming those motherfuckers, you know, like crazy. I'm just hoping that, that that's a strategy. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but, uh, yeah. So, in that game, you know, what does it take to win? And uh, those, the other sides, you know, they're winning. And we've got to do something and we've got to play their game a little bit in order to get in the seat, to steer different, and then so be it. Yeah. I have an illustration somewhere in here the New York Times did, and it's a uh, whoopee cushion with the word vote on the whoopee cushion. <laughs> uh, do you vote? Yeah, yeah, usually I do. Yeah. Yeah. And I find myself voting because I think it's like psychologically really healthy. Whether everyone convinces me it doesn't matter because it's a choice between Tweedledee or Tweedledum, or there's issues that directly affect us, like you know how they're spending your money in your local neighborhood. But I especially like being a poll cat because then I see all the neighbors that never look me eye to eye come up and go, oh, could you sign here and vote? And they're like, oh, I know you. And that's a beautiful way to connect with your neighbors. But uh, why do you vote? Uh, because it's like a, uh, it's a requirement. It, it is the basic requirement of a democracy. And yeah, the democracy we have is corrupt, ruined, bought out. So yeah, does it make a difference? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And what does it take? What's it take to vote? You know? Yeah. You walk down to the corner, you know, and you do this, and yeah. you're done, yeah. and you get your sticker, and you know, it, it doesn't take much. Yeah. And I think it should be like, isn't it in Australia? It's mandatory. Yep. Is Australia, you have to vote. And Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. And where? And Argentina. And Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if you know that wouldn't be a good idea. You know. Oh, it'd be a great. You want to be want to be American? You got to vote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got six, 1,500 people in my precinct. One election, 12 people showed up. I got to work for 12 hours. That's only one person an hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. It's sad commentary, and uh, you just got to keep doing it. Yeah. Do you uh, believe in capital punishment? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind expand on that? Uh, there's, there's some people, there's some criminals that, um, yeah, I'm like that. There's some criminals that man, shouldn't live. I think. I think. Yeah, life's precious. Somebody you take somebody's life, uh, maybe you should lose yours. You know, yeah. depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Like that guy in Connecticut. It was the hot one. You know, the mm -hmm. home invasion in Connecticut. 
This guy, you know, really an ugly story. It's like, it's like a bad fucking movie on HBO. Yeah. Home invasion. Kids. Rape. Murder. Yeah. Uh, horrible. <sighs> Let that guy live, you know? If there was a, if there was a way to send him life hard labor, so he never had a television, he never had contact with a human being, I think he should suffer. So yeah, I, I probably, I probably have, you know, Capitalist, yeah. 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 I probably would do it to some, to yeah. some uh, CEOs. Yeah, mm -hmm. Bernie Madoff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. Uh, let me Could just uh, suggest this uh, idea. Gregory Bateson in Double Bind says, uh, when the criminal gets caught doing his crime, is he in, is he thinking, well, I didn't have my crime skills going real good, or does he think, well, morally, I did something wrong? So he says, basically, punishment doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk about punishment versus rehab and that whole idea of prison. Mm -hmm. Does that really help? Because, I mean, when you throw Madoff in jail, isn't it just going to a country club jail? And so what? It doesn't really, yeah. that doesn't change people and go, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah, there's, there could be a way, like, guy like guys like Madoff, who, you know, it's just a property thing, that, but huge, uh, that, you know, they could be made to do this intense, extreme community service. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they got to work with the, the poorest of the poor. Yeah. They've got to work with, you know, uh, the mentally ill. They've got to work with, you know, the home uh, people who are stuck at home. They got to clean bedpans for the yeah. rest of their life. That's it, bedpans. That's where it goes. Yeah. yeah. Start there, you know. You've got to clean bedpans for the rest of your life, you son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, uh, re uh, definitely rehab should be a bigger. It's like uh, so many people are in jail for, yeah, uh, I blame society. Uh, you know, so, yeah. yeah, society should be to blame for a lot of the stuff, and society should, could, can help with rehab. Now, I understand that in Japan, uh, gardening and meditation are two big things. Anybody know about this? Gardening and meditation, big things in Japan for their prisons, and that they have a very low recidivism rate. Uh, in India, they're trying this Vipassana. There was a great movie. What was that movie? Uh, it was about teaching Vipassana meditation in India in the prisons. Yeah. And taking these, taking these hardcore criminals and just taking their head and go, and just adjusting it, and amazing miracles. So there are ways of that rehabilitation that the United States has, hasn't even gotten around to yet, you know. It's just punishment and uh, you lose your magazine privileges or some shit like that. Yeah. Uh, so they've got to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more uh, uh, you know, with yeah. the rehab in this country. Uh, but yeah, as far as capital punishment goes, I don't know. It's, it, yeah, I'm, I'm on the fence. I'd, yeah. I'd probably pull a trigger on somebody. Uh, if you were ruler of the world, what would you do on your first day? Hmm. God, rule of the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, first day. First day. Uh, take a day off. <laughs> <laughs> what was the motive of the cave artists? Oh, uh, the the creative itch, uh, seeing reality, being in wonder of this reality, this antelope. Holy shit! Look at that antelope. Holy shit, look at that animal go, look at that, look at that move, wow. And it stayed with him, you know? Wow, that animal moved like that, wow. And then he's got a stick with some carbon on it, you know? The fire. And the urge, just this creative urge <coughs> to reproduce the wonder of reality. Yeah. Very good. What's more important, conviction or compromise? Yes. Uh, it depends. Yeah. What's, what's, yeah. what's the situation? Yeah. Uh, either one can work to help you survive, to fight another day. Uh, either one can uh, advance the cause. Yeah. And it depends. Well, being in a group like the San Francisco Mind Troop, how, how, how do you deal with compromising in that situation? Uh, we argue a lot. Since we're a collective organization, you know, why socialism does, hasn't caught on in America? <laughs> Too many fucking meetings. <laughs> so uh, we're collective, and so we meet on everything. And when we get to these things, you know, these questions of, you know, I think we should. No, I think we should. I think no, right? And we argue and we talk, and uh, we don't go for consensus. 
uh, but we batter each other verbally until somebody gives in. <laughs> Basically, and okay, we'll do it that way. And then if if it's if you're the director of a show, you got the you got the, the caveat that you can say, uh, "Time's up. We got to make progress on scene two. I'm calling it that way. We're on. We're moving on." So uh, it works. Compromise. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, King Friedman says, if you were, uh, you know, uh, voted in as governor of Texas, what would you do on the first day? You'd say, no meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is ambition based more on fear or joy? Mm. Wow, wow. Fear or joy. Well, you know, fear, fear of failure will really drive you. Fear of hunger will really drive you. Fear of getting your ass kicked will really drive you. Uh, and then when you're driven and you achieve something, uh, then the joy kicks in, and that drives you. So I think maybe fear starts, and then joy takes over. Very good. Is loyalty based on reason? Hmm. Hmm. Reason. I'd say, well, my first impulse is to say, no, loyalty is based on feeling, but the yeah. feeling comes from the history of you with whatever the loyalty is, is being asked of, so, and that's the reason, so. But they say blood is thicker than mud. No. <laughs> <laughs> so T.S. Eliot said that po uh, uh, poetry is outing your inner dialogue. And so we have one thing in common, all these people in here have inner dialogues going on at once, we all do. And uh, this question is, is what language is your inner dialogue in, and then slash what form is your inner consciousness in? <laughs> uh, inner dialogue is in Yiddish, and uh, consciousness is in slapstick. <laughs> oh, <that> is good. <laughs> Ed, thank you for being so dang articulate. You don't know how many people go, well, I'm in my inner dialogues in English. Yiddish. Like it. So the great George Manukelly started the Ann Arbor Film Festival 50 years ago, showing experimental films. His sort of mantra is, ignore yourself. Jonas Mikas, another experimental film guy, says, there is no self-expression. Cecil Taylor, great jazz pianist, says, I'm just a vehicle. This stuff just comes through me. The question is twofold. Is art making more self-expression or more just vehicles of, of whatever dominant technology or culture, or culture is currently present? And the basic question is, can art be egoless? Mm, uh, yeah, uh, sure. I think it could be. Yeah. I think it could be, yeah, totally egoless. Uh, you get into... Uh, your ego takes you into the art. Your ego takes you into whatever the form it is, say, you know, oils or stencils or whatever the thing is. And you play with the mechanics of the medium. And then when you get into that space, when you get into that creative space, uh, you may achieve that egoless thing. You may achieve, you know, your hand takes over. Uh, you know, you're, you're creating something that your mind didn't think of. Uh, you're creating something that you had no idea was there. Uh, my, the Saint Stupid image uh, on the little thing, logo. Originally, the first in '79 when I did the parade, I, I took the image uh, out of a German medical text of. A uh, about this big, an engraving. Turn of the century, German medical text, uh, and it had all these engravings of um, uh, medical abnormalities, you know, hunchbacks and the elephant man, you know, very de depicted, you know, very clearly. And one of them was this hydrocephalic child, uh, just a bust, conical head. Hydrocephalum is a water on the skull, misshapes the skull. And it was this perfectly, a perfect cone, like this. And a beatific smile. Okay? And I went, that's it. That's the image for Saint Stupid. Because Saint Stupid was related to Feast of Fools. The fool, a lot of the, uh, the fools, a lot of times were the, the hunchbacks. 
The hunchback was good to touch the hunchback for good luck. It was good to feed the hunchback, keep him nice, keep you know, you do good things for the the club foots, the misshapen. Uh, that's a kind of a karma thing that the the, the crown, the, uh, the princes, they did. And they would, they'd would be jugglers, they'd be entertainers and stuff. So you'd have these malformed around, you know, for entertainment purposes. Uh, so, uh, and at the same time, I'm reading Jane Roberts, Seth Speaks. And she's talking, you know, about another alternative reality. So, you know, this guy speaks through her, Seth, you know, and he's talking about, you know, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Burning bush, why not this? Uh, and then in one of the books, I was reading it at that exact same time, she had this character from several dimensions out speak through her. And when she did that, she talked in a mo her husband was writing all this down. She would talk in a monotone and a cone of light would form above her head. At the same time on television, the cone heads were on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Three things happened. I went, this ain't stupid, this, this cone head guy. The next year, uh, put the, I put the, the flyer together, mailed it to a bunch of people. In 79, we had a couple of dozen people show up at the Bank of America, and we had our first parade. Okay. So that was the image. That, and it's an engraving, black and white engraving, but it's like a photograph, like reality. So it's got that deformity, and, you know, deformity is you know, mm -hmm. kind of testy on, uh, you know, for normal people, you know, sometimes. Next year, I went looking for it. I couldn't find it, and I had to send this thing out. So I sat down with a Pentel brush pen, and I went, he looked like this. Oh, he looked like this. He looked like this, and I made about six or seven drawings, pen drawings, real fast on a, on a piece of cardboard. And I went, that's not him, and I threw him away, and I tore my studio apart at 5 in the morning, and I'm calling people up. Did you have last year's post? Nobody's got it. And I went to the garbage, and I pulled one out, and I went, this will have to do. And I ripped off the one up, and I put, it, I put that on the flyer, and I sent that out. And it changed the tone because it's, it's, this, it's a cartoon. It's cute. It's charming. Okay, and it wasn't this slightly dark image of a really deformed child, you know. So, and that came out of where? You know, it came out of uh, deadline. <laughs> I had to have something. And I did something real fast, and I wasn't thinking. But all this stuff fed into it. All yeah. this historical shit fed into it. All these visual things fed into it, yeah. you know. And out came that, and uh, it changed the tone. Uh, a lot of people just responded to it, uh, and I, or eventually I found the old one again. Uh, it's up on the website somewhere. And uh, but but you can't stay with the new one. Yeah, but I stay with the new yeah. one. Yeah. In fact, everyone can pick up a sticker. They're right There's over stickers there. Right Free, right stickers right Free stickers. Free right stickers. Right yeah. So that was beautiful because it reminded me also. So would you say like the mime troupe is just a mirror because you're responding to the current events to write the current play? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we have a. Horrible, terrible, miserable motherfucking writing process. <laughs> we wait till January, and then we start having meetings, and we start going, what's the zeitgeist? What's in the air? And sometimes it's obvious. Like when the first Gulf War happened, we knew we were going to do a show about the first Gulf War. Uh, and uh, I directed the show. It was called Back to Normal, and it was a great show. But it took, we decided on it in, uh, like in February, and we had March and April, and, uh, and part of May to write it. And then June to put it up and open on the Fourth of July. That's 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 a big that's a big leap for us having three months to work on a play. Usually, again, because we're a collective, and sometimes the obvious, the zeitgeist doesn't it hits everybody in different ways. So we argue for January, we argue for February, we argue for March. I remember going away once and coming back thinking they're going to have decided, and I come back and it's April. They're still arguing about everybody's got no. I think it's got to be. It's got to be prisons. No, it's got to be about food. No, 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 no. It's the legal system. It's got to be the legal system. And then everybody's bringing in somebody to talk. They go out and they bring in speakers. Mm -hmm. And they bring in the articles. And everybody's reading everybody's stuff. And they're all trying to decide on what's going on. So the writing, we open on 4th of July, and the show is nowhere near done. And it's not done for another month. And it's, you know, we don't do the show for two, two and a half months. So our process, because we try to be on that zeitgeist, we don't go a year from now and we're going to do a show about this. Because... No, it's, that's too far away. We've got to be closer to the bone of, uh, of what the zeitgeist is. So, but it puts us in a tough spot, and our shows are rough because of that. Yeah. And you touched sort of on this duality thing we all face, the yin-yang. 
Um, McClellan said that you can turn breakdowns into breakthroughs. And so, uh, what's the function of laughter? Ooh, yeah. Uh, release of tension. Uh, taking you out of the seriousness of the moment and giving you a, uh, a jolt of other, a jolt of, of the other. Yeah. Uh, another dimension, another, uh, another way of thinking. Uh, catching you off guard, and, uh, and, and so kind of like a wake up thing. It's like, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But when you're like when you're, when you're serious, you're you're leaning into it, and you're, you're closing off, and you're focusing, and laughter makes you go boom. Okay. Yeah. Gurdjieff said, "Laughter is the reconciliation of yes and no." Yeah. Figured he'd say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Allen said, behind every joke, there's a grievance. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yeah. There's, oh, there's another guy, a, a big influence, Steve Allen. Yeah. Steve Allen, growing up watching Steve Allen, uh, I think probably I would count him and maybe Sid Caesar, you know, yeah. uh, as the two big guys who just blew my mind. But Steve Allen's, uh, his show brought so many things together, and his, his joy, yeah. his laugh, his ability to just fall off his fucking chair under the floor laughing uh, at something, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Steve's big. What about Ernie Anderson? Say again? Ernie Anderson. Oh, er yeah, Ernie Anderson, Cleveland, Ohio, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Soupy Sales. Soupy Sales, yeah. yeah. And so another one... Kovacs. Say again? Ernie Kovacs. Oh, Ernie Kovacs, yeah. Another one uh, that we didn't mention that I like to talk about because there's a correlation between... Uh, Alfred E. Newman and John Cage, that works real well. Uh, you know, Alfred E. Newman said, uh, the English language is the only language where a double negative is a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what, uh, what Cage learned from McLuhan was that you, actually from James Joyce Finnegan's Wait, is that if you condense something and satirize it, then you'll, you'll it'll be more effective in communicating it. Yeah, yeah. So that's... What he, McLuhan told him to do with Finnegan's Wake, so he condensed and satirized. And he says, "We've done that for years. We read Mad Magazine. Why go mm -hmm. see Rocky when you can read it yes. in Mad Magazine? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, you get it faster." Mm -hmm. So, did you grow up reading Mag? Absolutely, yeah. Mad cracked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, what is the essential element for a joke? Uh, a surprise. Yeah. The turn. Look, the turn up. Yeah. 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 Can you believe that? Well, it's really been great. We're going a little more here. Is perception reality? Uh, no, it's uh, one thirtieth worth of a second behind. Uh, <laughs> that was what Neil Cassidy's thing. Neil Cassidy was kept saying about that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to close that gap, mm. that one thirty fourth of a second. Uh, it's happening, and you're, then you know it's happening. But still, it's one thirty fourth of a second. So that's, he was pushing for that. And uh, McLuhan also probed Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, saying that uh, artists dream awake. We all have something in common. We all have these amazing creative powers we use at night when we're sleeping, create these amazing scenarios. He says also artists use that creative powers while they're awake, so they dream awake. Have dreams played a role in your creative process? Uh, yeah. I don't think so. Not that I, I couldn't pinpoint a spot where it... Something that I did came out of a dream. No, my dreams, have, they vary too. I mean, I've had the real big ones. I've had the ones that I really still remember. I've had the ones that I, God, I wish I remember because there was that thing in there. That thing, what was that thing? I know that thing. I could feel the importance of that thing in the dream, but I can't remember it. You know, that one? Yeah. Uh, but then there's ones I just, I've written down, you know, and I've seen pictures of it. And I, you know, I've, I've had a little log and I wrote some of them down. But I don't think they've ever played much in um, that I know yeah. in my career. And we have this game about rewording aphorisms. Boy, I'd love to play that with you sometime. And McLuhan reworded Browning's great line, our reach should exceed our grasp, or what is heaven for? Mm -hmm. And he said, our reach should exceed our grasp, or what is a metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> How and why do you use metaphor in your art? Uh, 
only to uh, make the table uh, level. You know, one leg shorter than the other, you know, in a story or something. I uh, put a metaphor under the leg and it evens it up. <laughs> that was <laughs> Why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? Uh, yeah, because they think they're special. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're special. They haven't gotten in touch with their insignificance yet. Uh, and, yeah, we're all special, you know, because we, we, we grew up, mom's going, oh, you're so special, and grandma's going, you're so special, everybody's saying, you know, you're, you're growing up, your first consciousness, your, your consciousness is, is being programmed, you're from arm to, you know, to toddler, to, oh, you're special, you got, oh, you're special, you're the cutest, you're the smartest, you're the fastest, yeah, usually, you know, yeah. everybody gets that, you know, so, uh, you sucker enough, you buy it, and you believe it, and you try to continue on and, uh, in a, as a special person and, uh, until you run into that insignificance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's that was good because uh, we're all thinking about Occupy, uh, whatever, Occupy uh, Oddball tonight and mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street, and uh, pretty inspiring to drive through Oakland today and see how many people are out there and you go by Berkeley and there's just a couple, but hey, wherever. It's like 1,100 cities across the U.S. Yeah. That's pretty cool and it's pretty inspiring, but uh, we're sitting here and we're prospering and it always gets me. I mean, I'm for it and I'm inspired by it, but at the same time it seems, aren't most of these people prospering. Like one friend went down to Occupy LA and she was upset because there were a, a pile of pizza boxes and a, can, a whole bunch of Coca-Cola cans. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, what, what's your basic take on the whole Occupy thing? Uh, necessary, a necessary uh, thing to happen now. Uh, the early 60s, you had the civil rights demonstrations, you had anti-war demonstrations, you had the demonstrations for the environment, gay rights, women's rights, all those demonstrations put people in the street and again it's like a choir thing to see how many people are thinking the same as you. Uh, so the here in the last days of capitalism uh, uh, it's necessary to go out there and, and be counted I think to it just it, as part of a crowd, just add your number to the crowd yeah. uh, to say that something's got to change. Now you know you, might, you don't have the solution, but you're, you're calling for attention to be paid to find the solution. And uh, we don't have a vote to do that right now. You know, we have some votes coming up, but voting is in and in. Uh, more direct is your body in the street. And uh, I, th I think it's necessary. I think more people are better. Yeah. I agree with you, and I'm glad you said that well articulated. Um, but I also always am questioning effectiveness. And... Um, I've had this question to a couple modern thinkers, and I'll tell you their reaction, and then you can expound on yours. And that is William Pope L., who calls himself the friendliest black artist in America, a professional performance artist kind of guy, he chained himself to a bank door in New York and handed out $5 bills and called it reverse panhandling. Yeah, nice. and, and uh, nice. many years ago, he got on NPR, and everybody talked about this, he dressed up, a black man, dressed up in a Superman outfit and crawled on the streets of Wall Street and the black businessmen were pissed. Mm -hmm. And so pretty effective, got an NPR, yeah. Yeah. but my question was what's more effective, William Pope L crawling on Wall Street or a bunch of kids, you know, a bunch of people in a park occupying Wall Street. And I asked Phil Proctor, uh, Phil Peter, excuse me, Peter Bergman of Fireside Theater and he goes, well both of course, well I know I agree both are effective. I asked DJ Spooky and he goes, well, William Pope L is more effective. So it's not that it's a race. Of course we know it's both. But how do we do it and know there's some effect? Do we just do it or do we, can we gauge how can we be most effective? Does that matter? Uh, I think it only matters that you have a feeling that you need to do something and you take what it is that you do. You're a graphics designer, you're a performer, you're a musician. You're an accountant. You find a way to take something that you can do effectively and take it out there and do it to, uh, uh, in the service of this cause, whatever it is. And you, you don't ask, you don't wonder, well, you can wonder if you want, but you don't do it to say, 
Well, I'm going to do it only if it has you know 0.6 yeah. on the Richter scale. Yeah. You, know, you just got you just do it, and the aggregate of everybody doing it together, all those little <coughs> all those little actions, you know, uh, the more the better, yeah. the bigger the, the bigger the ripple. Yeah. It reminds me of Warhol said, "Don't worry about." Whether your art's good or bad, let them worry about it. Just keep making it. Yeah. 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 Lewis Carroll said, oh, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, believed in an impossible thing? I don't think so. Uh, I can't, can't think of any. Yeah. And have you checked out any of these articles about the Believing Brain, the new uh, book by this guy who puts out Skeptic Magazine? He says, seeing is believing is really wrong. It's the other way. Believing is seeing, is that what our brain is, is a belief engine. And what we do is form the belief and then only see the things that support the belief. So, he, you know, it's sort of funny because the kids are chanting, the whole world is watching. And so, what do you think of that? Seeing is believing is backwards. It's actually believing is seeing. Uh, it's worth looking at. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the fish. Um, what elements of your performing have remained the same, and what elements have changed over the how many how many years you've been performing? Uh, almost forty. Pretty good. Four decades. Could we applaud this man? Yeah. Four decades. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what elements have remained the same and what have changed over the four decades? Uh, I've gotten in touch with my inner loud mouth wise ass. Uh, blossoming. That started the blossom. Uh, when I started performing, I started performing as a uh, mind. A uh, mime. I'll repeat that again. I'm here. I'm confessing. Uh, hi, my name's Ed Holmes, and I was a mime. I mean, white face, white tights. <laughs> really? Yes. I, I, is it, when I went to school on a GI Bill, Laney was my first place, and I took everything for two years. And then on a, on a whim, I took this mime and movement class because only it, it fit in a schedule, and I was just needed to fit something in a schedule. And I and so I, I'll take that. And I I met this guy who's ten years my senior. Who was the mentor you're supposed to see once in a while on the road? And he took my head and he went, and he said, he says, you're a performer. And he says, you've done this before. I says, no. And he says, well, I've been a clown, you know, I've been a wise ass. And he says, you're a performer. I got a troupe. Berkeley Mime Troupe was a spin-off of his Laney class. Ten people, white face, white tights, doing not politics but art and comedy. And I joined that and I started performing. And you know, I was doing it physically. And then I got into this Commedia Troupe for Tully Bologna. Uh, through the you know through the Ren Faire circuit, and we developed this Commedia dell'arte thing, and then the verbal developed, and I got in touch with this Commedia dell'arte tradition, this Renaissance Italian wise asses, and that's where the, the satire, that's where the playing with the audience, that's where uh, you know uh, attacking the institutions uh, with comedy, that's where that developed. Uh, so uh, that uh, that's what what was the question? <laughs> um, what elements of your performing have remained the same and what elements have changed over the four decades? And I just refined my wise ass. Yeah. That's probably what I did. I mean, yeah. that's what it, it, I got in touch with. And I always was wise ass. You know, we were talking about that, you, the, uh, the sitting in the movies, you know, yeah. and wise assing with your buddies. Yeah. You know, what's, we were talking about that. Where was just, uh, did you do it here? Yeah, you yeah, yeah. got a movie playing and you got some wise asses right. sitting there making comments and we make right. each other crack up. Right. So I did that, did yeah. that a lot and I was pretty good at it. I got a reputation. But, you know, it, it, that didn't pan out right away. I didn't see that as the source of my direction out of high school. Yeah. Uh, I had to go somewhere else for a while. Uh, but man, I got tapped back into it again. It just, boom, took off. Very good. Mm -hmm. Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement and he says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than to overcome a weakness which we're normally taught. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a weakness that you've incorporated to become a strength? Uh, let's see. Uh, I'd say 
A weakness would be trusting people. Trusting that they will do the right thing. Definitely a weakness. I can see in my past. And getting burned by that. But uh, I think refining the way I looked at what that trust was, what I what that trust made the expectation of that person. Do I meet this person, we're involved in some sort of thing. Uh, I'm trusting them to do the right thing, I'm trusting them to tell me the truth and stuff. But there's, yeah, I think a refinement of my awareness of how they're responding, uh, that's kind of vague. But no, no, I think, what is naivety? You sort of use naivety yeah. to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of, it's, it, diameter, it just it came to, it, like, it's like an Aikido thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's push and pull. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. American Indians and Eastern culture respect their elders. Can you explain Western culture's disdain for old age? Uh, a lot of old people are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and they have reason to be. They've had fucked jobs. They've had terrible lives. They went to war. They, they raised families that they shouldn't have. They had wives they shouldn't have stayed with. They had kids they shouldn't have brought up. You name it. They just, you know, I look at people in my life, my, my family. I don't know how my dad did it. God, he was, his job was horrible. Was, you know, he went through the first, the second world war. He was wounded a couple of times, you know, and he comes out and he goes, he works at this power plant for 40 years. My mother was bipolar. She was nuts. I remember my dad just giving up and scooping me up and we're going to Niagara Falls. Come on, we're getting out of the house and in two days we go on a drive. And he, most, I'd say 90%, I'd say 99% of the people are, have miserable lives yeah. and as you get older, Where's that misery go? Most of them just carry it right along with them and it festers, and that's why they're assholes. Yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant. I wish all the, all the people I interviewed would have more fun with these questions. Thank you, I appreciate that. Because it made me want, I have to say this because it sounds maybe, I don't know, it's not cruel or mean spirited, but I think some people get Alzheimer's because they're just saying, I'm going to check out yeah, early. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, okay, yeah. and just live. And I think Muhammad Ali did that, in fact. He goes, uh -huh. I've fucking been entertaining people for so many years. I'm just going to check out. And you can sort of pretend like I'm a veg, but <laughs> yeah, I'm really yeah. in here I'm in watching here. you go, ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, because mm -hmm. that, that thing with Alzheimer's and how much they really know and they yeah. can tap into songs once in a while. Oh, and yeah. mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. So why would, you know this artist Joseph Boyd, he mm -hmm. tries to transform society with art. Mm -hmm. And he, why would he say, make the secrets productive? Uh, yeah, make the secrets productive. Uh, get them engaged in, uh, get the secrets, secret, if a secret is kept a secret, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. You know, it's under the chair, it's in your back pocket, it's in the closet. Okay. You've got to bring it out and get it involved and find out where it fits into fixing things, making things better, uh, advancing the cause, which is, uh, I'd say, advancing. The big cause is advancing human consciousness, you know, yeah. keeping the species going a little bit longer so we can find mm -hmm. the answer, so we can, we can become Star Trek, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, Lou Welsh, you know, the great poet who went and killed himself, says, guard the secrets, constantly reveal them. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you tell us a secret? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, let's see. My, a secret. Uh, I was fired from my first job out of high school for misappropriation of the company vehicle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can anger be a productive emotion? Yes. Uh, I think anger should be a tool in everybody's box. Yeah. Uh, and you got to keep it uh, oiled and ready. you got to know how to use it. Uh, I've, uh, and i give you an example here. i give you an example. Uh, Mind Troop is going through a problem with uh, its board. Originally, okay, so the Mind Troop was created by R.G. Davis in the 60s, 59. So he was a dictator between 59 and and through the 60s, he turns on his bunch of hippies in the 60s to socialism. And so this big pack of ragtag actors study socialism and you know, 
Mao and Marxists and everything, and they realize that socialism is worker-owned. It's the workers who should make the decisions together, and that he was a dictator. And so they told R.G. Davis, he says, we're going to become a collective. You want to join us or you leave? And he leaves, slams the door and says, you won't survive without me. For 40 years he's on the sideline. He's a high-octane intellectual. Uh, thinks he's a, you know, Mr. Revolutionary. Uh, I don't think he's had to work a day in his life. Uh, so his working class credentials nil. But he's on the sideline. And the mind troop could never do anything right. Uh, win an OB award in New York, you know, we sold out. Win a Tony award, we sold out. Uh, constantly just bad-mouthing the mind troop. He has wound up, wound his way, slithered his way like a fucking snake onto our board. Now the board of the mind troop is, a, is paper, meaning the board meet once a year, sign the paper, we're 5013C, all the decisions are made by the collective. But in the bylaws adopted back in the 70s, there are basic mechanics that the board is in control, higher and fire. So R.G. Davis wrangles his way on the board, slightly illegal, still to be addressed, uh, and starts causing trouble. And start, he, he starts manipulating people. And I remember he, and we had this big meeting, the collective and all the board, and he had a tape recorder hidden under his chair. Because <laughs> nobody takes good notes. Nobody takes notes good. So I have to re That's a fucking felony. That's a fucking felony. I lost it. I fucking, I leapt up out of my chair, I had my shirt off, and I was leaning across the fucking table, and I was headed for this. And he's 70 years old. I didn't give a shit. I was going to, I was going to wring his fucking neck. And then he held me back. And I was raging. I, my anger, out of control. Out of control. It's very embarrassing, you know. Uh, a lot of emails back and forth. I should attend, you know, uh, <laughs> seminars, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Anger seminars. And I said, sure, you would attend assholes somewhere. <laughs> Next time me and R.G. Davis met was in the bookstore down in Valencia. Um, in modern times, M Mind Troop had a little book coming out. It was the end of our, near the end of our season, so they said, come on down, promote your book, hustle your final shows at, uh, Labor, uh, uh, at Dolores Park. And uh, I was doing Dick Cheney at the time, so me and uh, Amos, who was W, we did the, we were MCs, and we're doing it, and he comes in, and he's sitting in the back. And I remember, uh, we're at Michael Sullivan, who wrote the show, Godfellas, uh, our nice religious show, which I helped write. Uh, and he, R.G. Davis, can never do anything right. Everything we do is wrong. And blah, 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 blah. How come you never talked about this? How come you didn't talk about Israel in the show? If you talk about religion, talk, you know, and, he's like, and I'm standing back there like this, going, R.G., is this, mind you ever done anything that, you know, that you could approve of, ever? And he says, oh, and you. And he tells me, you know, you're perfect for your part. And I said, what do you mean, my part? You know, I don't understand. And, just, yeah, 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 yeah. and suddenly my anger came up again, but it was like this focused little laser. And all I did was reach down and grab him by the collar and lift him up and take him to the door. <laughs> and throw him out the door. And, and I was calm. It was like, I, it, no, no, <clears throat> it was just, that's it. We're done. You're out of here. So, anger. It can be a useful tool, but you gotta, yeah, you gotta control it. Yeah. Very good. So you brought up socialism, that was good. And here's this line from the socialist pioneer, John Basil Barnhill. He says, where the people fear the government, you have tyranny. Where the government fears the people, you have liberty. Any comment? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Agree? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, right on. Okay. Yeah. What do you think the difference between rebellion and revolution is? Uh, revolution just goes in circles. Rebellion changes things. <laughs> what do you think is the difference between rights and responsibilities? Uh, acknowledgement of uh, the necessity of your engagement, uh, acknowledgement of what needs to be done, awareness of your position in society, yeah. what you need to do, um, yeah, what you need to do. Is human progress cyclical or cumulative? Are we just going in circles or are we getting better or worse? Uh, it's, it goes like this. Like a cone? Yeah, it's a spiral. Yeah. It goes up and then it falls off over here and then it goes up and it catches a thermal and it goes down and it goes under your chair. It's like that. What's the most significant difference between women and men plumbing a side? <laughs> uh, brain chemistry. Definitely brain chemistry. 
uh, we have this hardwired uh, reproductive thing. Our DNA just drives us to to reproduce itself. And uh, uh, yeah, here's what I don't know where I read, where I read this. Well, men desire sex. Women desire being desired. Why do you think women live longer than men? Because uh, they're you know making us do all the work. <laughs> That's good. You, you ever hear this one? <laughs> That's good. You ever hear the word mafia starts with the letters ma because women run the world, but they let men think they run the world. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying I agree or disagree. Yeah. I think it's an interesting little. Oh, well, I'm sure there. Is, yeah, oh, there's there's some powerful women. Uh, there's a story about Barbara Bush when they were the first uh, when the first Bush boy W uh, thing. Yeah. There's a reporter in the room with the family, and it's, it's, it, Florida's they're starting to report. No, we're going to go for Gore. In fact, it's going to go for Gore. And they saw Barbara Bush put down the tray, call somebody, and go out the door. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, uh, something changed. She called Jeb. She made some calls. She is the power in that family. You create what you resist, has been said. Uh, Bob Goldthwait even morphed it to, uh, oh, that's Bob right there. Hey, Bob. Mm -hmm. um, Later. <laughs> Bob morphed it to, you are what you hate. So, um, and actually, Louis Bunuel took it another step farther. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. So, uh, you create what you resist. Any comment? Now, I'm not saying you, but you mm -hmm. get the idea what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that is a factor. Yeah, you, gotta, you get, you're facing big, ugly people doing big, ugly things. And the only way to overcome it is to become a big, ugly yourself. Yeah. I think it has validity, uh, but uh, if you're aware of it, uh, you can overcome it, I guess, I would hope. Yeah. How do you find peace of mind? Me, personally? Yeah. Uh, the desert. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is go camping in the desert. Me and my wife, Janet, uh, we're a couple desert rats. And that's very big, big on my uh, list of how to get peace of mind. Big spaces, big vistas, uh, quiet. Uh, I can achieve it in the backyard too. Got a nice backyard in Berkeley. Sit there and look at goldfish for half an hour. That'll do it. It's just shutting up. Yeah, peace of mind. Shut up. Uh, and enjoy nature. Hmm. How long have you been with your wife? Twenty-five years. How do you explain the longevity? No idea. Okay. No idea. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? Mm. <laughs> uh, don't play so much football. It's bad on your knees. <laughs> <laughs> Should toilet paper go over the roll or under? Oh, definitely under. Under? Oh, definitely. It's, an, it's an under thing. Gravity. Doesn't fight gravity as much. It takes a little <laughs> If a, if a publisher was to release your autobiography, off the top of your head, what would the title be? <laughs> Bozo Deluxe. And, uh, Ed, they said, we'd like to scent the glue in the binding. What smell would it be? Uh, not patchouli. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing, because I got that question, because... Madonna released a book and it smelled like patchouli. And we go, hmm, I, I can develop that. I can develop that into a question. <laughs> if a statue was built in your honor, where would you want it displayed, and what would it be made of? Ooh, uh, <laughs> uh, it would be uh, uh, dis displayed in Wall Street, and made of pigeon shit. <laughs> Please tell me something good you never had and you never want. Something good I never had and never want. Um, tits. <laughs> that is a good answer. If you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? <laughs> Smile at the circumstance. <laughs> What is the healthiest cultural shift you see developing today? And knowing uh, 
who are fucked. Uh, yeah, you know, the capitalism falling apart and people realizing that it's falling apart, that it can't be sustained, that things aren't going to go back to normal like they were three years ago before the crash. Oh, when well, things get back to normal, they'll have a job. When things get back to normal, no, there's no more normal. Normal can't be that normal can't be sustained, and I think it's you know, part of the occupied thing. Is a lot of people going, we got there's no plans, there's no plan B, plan A is fucked. Yeah, that was beautiful. What gives you the most optimism? Mm. Uh, the luck in my life. Are we watching it happen, or are we making it happen? Oh, the part that you're watching is made, and if not made by you, it's made by somebody else. So, yes. That is a good answer. I'm going to ask Ed a few more questions, and I hope you guys will uh, join in, and uh, we'll carry this on a little longer. Ed, uh, this is Mencken uh, many years ago saying, the primary function of democracy was to create heroes and villains. So it's just sort of to set up this idea, why do we have to have competition? In a lot of ways, you know, we both grew up in Midwest, sports, drive, competition. Manny Farber said a good, great film critic and abstract expressionist says, you know, why is criticism so wrapped up in measuring? So, I mean, we're, it's great to play football or have, play sports, but why do we have to have a winner and loser? And so, just to, you know, it's sort of like, I'm still struggling how to word this question, but you'll get an idea maybe what you want to talk about here. It's um, this is one more line about sort of, is competition hardwired? Why do we have to have it? And this line goes, games were created to give non-heroes the illusion of winning. In real life, you don't know who really won or lost, but you can tell who a hero is and who is not. So is it all about hero making, or why do we have to have competition? Uh, it makes, it gives the play more weight. It gives the play, you know, something uh, beyond itself. The, the play itself is, it should be enough, but I think if you just played without any competition, it, it would be, it would start to get, well, stale, maybe get boring, and that competition makes it push itself uh, in uh, different directions and uh, makes demands on, on the play that expose new and wonderful things. Yeah. As also, and also horrible things. Yeah. And Ed, in closing, uh, John Steinbeck wrote a book, Grapes of Wrath, and uh, the movie version, you see the guy standing there with the gun on his land, and one of his associates, Tom Crony, comes through in the car, and he knows him, he's just the messenger, and he says, Dude, you got to get out of here because they're building a road. Get off your land. They're going to plow it through. And the guy standing there with the gun says, Hey, my grandfather farmed this land. My father farmed this land. I farm this land. We own this land. Then who do I shoot? <laughs> so what is the function of blame? I mean, why do we have to blame? Uh, to uh, get what you want. <laughs> Ed, I'm going to blame you. I've had an amazing time and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you Ed. And uh, the Bish. Could you give it up for the Bish? Now, uh, we'd love to hear your questions or comments. Anybody in the got a question or comment? Go ahead. Uh, you alluded to Neil Cassidy trying to close the gap. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? But what, what, what exactly was that? Perception. What's happening? What's happening? And what you? I, I see you. Okay. I hear you. Okay. But it's not instantaneous. There's a thirty fact, thirty fourth of a second delay between what you just said and my hearing and transpiring in my brain and hearing what you said. Thirty fourth of a second. Three. Seeing. Okay. Thirty fourth of a second. All that. So, yeah. He uh, talked fast. Lived fast. Uh, took a lot of drugs to try to close that gap. He just wanted to he wanted to experience raw reality rather than delayed. The real thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. one more real. 
I think there's one also great word McClune uses is called rear view mirrorism. And we go forward looking in a rear view mirror. And he's sort of saying, be here now, present. In fact, Wyndham Lewis says, great artists live in the present and write a detailed history of the future. That's, that's you, Ed. That's the mind truth. They're writing a detailed history of the future by being here now and telling us, hey, here's the situation now. Go ahead. I've been seeing the mind trip shows since the late 80s. And I love all of them, and um, I, I love your work. I love watching you perform, and I, Michael Sullivan and all the people involved. But I always feel like um, we're just standing around patting each other on the back. What kind of an experience have you had showing mind trip shows to quote unquote conservative audiences, and have you found that that's broken down any barriers? Uh, yeah, a lot of times uh, our shows, you know, we, sometimes our shows have a real thing at the end where you go, this is what you got to do. Other times it's just kind of like, okay, what are we going to do? It's, it's sometimes just the question, you know, leaving it to the audience. Uh, so there was a show we did in 89 called Seeing Double, our uh, Palestinian-Israeli show. I like to call it our kike and camel jockey show. <laughs> and in that show we talked about the Palestinian thing, and it was a great show. Uh, and at the end of each show there were... Uh, Arabs, and there were Jews at the front of the stage talking to each other, and they were talking to each other, and they were talking to us, and they were talking, you know, oh, you didn't bring up this, you didn't bring up that, but we'd all look at each other and go, they're talking, they're talking, and we took that to Jerusalem, we did a, we formed a <coughs> Jerusalem festival in 89, and we got censored by the Israelis, and we got to sneak over to the West Bank and perform it for the Palestinians, so we performed it for a progressive Jewish audience in Jerusalem, in a backwater theater, they pushed, they shoved us aside when they realized they, what we're doing. They go, oh, well, I'll do it over here. So progressive Jews came and saw it there, and we snuck it over to the West Bank. Progressive Arabs, Palestinians saw it there. And at the end, long conversations, again, but the essence of those conversations were, you told their side very well, but not ours. Mm -hmm. Both of them. But it, it was like you said, well, this show was made not for you here in Israel slash Palestine. It was made for an American audience trying to bring them up to speed on this very complicated, you know, uh, thing, and to get people talking. So sometimes a show to do that, yeah, is very satisfying. Other times, yeah, people come up and they just go, well, I don't know what to do yet. Uh, yeah, I says, we don't either. We don't either. He says, there's, there's some options. You know, some of the options aren't too nice. Some of the options are, you know, revolution. It's, you know, it's not a pickup line, you know. It overturns things. It sets things on fire. Leads, you know. Is there some alternative to that? Let's find that you know, before we have to get to that. So we, sometimes it's just getting the conversation going. Mm. Uh, one, one person says the revolution is two people talking. Mm. So there, you mm -hmm. got two people talking. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, you talked about being in touch with your insignificance. Yeah. How do you um, reconcile that with? Uh, being your creative, your activism, your yeah. creative thoughts. Uh, knowing that, uh, I would have been an astronomer or something, you know. Uh, I would have loved to be, uh, astronomy stuns me. Would have, that's, to me, the Hubble is the pinnacle of human endeavor. The Hubble peeking into that distance and bringing back these visions. Just, you know, one fucking amazing wonder after another. And the astrophysicist going, we don't fucking know what's going on. <laughs> you know? And it's like, just a wash, so all this smartness and all this like stuff, yeah, yeah, but still, this huge, ah, and, we're, and we're nothing in it, we're just nothing. You know, and if there's a feeling of, if there's a hopelessness, I mean, I guess some people uh, on a certain chemistry, brain chemistry, or on a certain medication diet or something will take that and be uh, depressed, you know, at the, at the hopelessness of anything I do. But I think if there's a thing you push through the hopelessness, or you embrace the hopelessness, or there's a way, there's a way of, I don't have that. Maybe it's my chemistry or something, or it's the luck of my life that I've, I've had some down, deep, down, dark, moments of the soul, but somehow they shifted. There was a polar shift, and it's like, everything's possible. If it's hopeless, anything's possible. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Uh, how does it 
appeal to be the bad guy. Oh, that, it's great. Bad guys on stage are the best. <laughs> chew the, you get to chew the scenery. You were get, you always the bad guy? No. Uh, no, no. Uh, no. Uh, the, the, first, the first mime troupe, Berkeley mime troupe, little skits and stuff like that, uh, comedy stuff. Uh, for Tully Bologna, I was Arlecchino, who is the, uh, the positive element uh, in, in Commedia dell'arte. He's the, the life force. Uh, mime troupe, uh, credit to my race, cheesy white guy. <laughs> uh, bad CEO, corrupt senator, you know, uh, uh, Dick Cheney. Uh, it's pr but those are the most fun. Man, walking out in Dolores Park <laughs> when there's 3,000 people and walking out as Dick Cheney and people start booing. <laughs> 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 and, I stop, and I get to stop the show and go, fuck you all. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you, fuck you. I'm going to take it half an hour here. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you in the back. Like, you know, and just, you know, the piece. And here, I just, and it just it runs through the whole show, and everything I do, you can feel this people going. Ugh. I've had people come up at the end and start talking to me like I was Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> why are you so? What are you so? Why? Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, they're built. But I'm not. I've played some very uh, sympathetic and uh, uh, comic parts. Uh, yeah. But the villains definitely have a, an edge to them as far as. Uh, Fun of playing through the through the wall again, playing with the audience. Uh, any other questions or comments? Go ahead. What was the most stupid thing you ever done? <laughs> you you ask that question all the time. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Stu yes, uh, and uh, I got to do, I just got to do doing Burning Man. I set up a tabernacle of Saint Stupid, and we had this beautiful tent with these incredible pa ceiling paintings by Scott Seaman. And we bring people in, and I do the six rituals, you know. And one of the rituals, is confession, and I hold the microphone. I'm like, "This is the stupidest thing you've ever done." Mm -hmm. And people would blurt out something, you know, some usual things, DUIs, you know, or blah blah blah. But man, occasionally, people would say something, and you could see it ring inside of them. You could see them quiver. There's one woman when she said something. She said something as innocuous as, "I didn't call him back," and she turned around and she started crying. And then at the end of the thing, when I took everybody outside and was thanking them, giving them buttons and stickers, she comes up and gives me a big hug. She had a little, you know, a release, a thing, you know. Uh, for me, oh God, stupid. Not, I don't think I've, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't done it yet. I haven't done it yet. I've done some, but they haven't been the stupidest. I think the stupidest is yet to be done. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good goal. Anyone else? Comments or questions? Ed, what a pleasure. You are the man. The man. All in all the good. Big thank you to uh, Stephen Parr for having us here. Dan Gunn, all the great people, all of you.